Okay, so uh, I was given an order that we should start. Um, so guys, today I'd like to talk to you about four diseases I have identified during my professional lifetime. Uh, my name is Piotr Przybyl, uh, I live nearby, I'm self-employed as remote freelance software gardener. If people ask me, so where do you work exactly, the answer is when I leave my sleeping room is the second door to the left. That's where I work. And uh, for like 80% of my life I've been JVM developer and 80% of my life I'm a web developer, web, rest, such stuff. So I've never done a mobile application, if that's your concern. But I still think that some of these diseases are uh, subject to mobile work as well. Uh, okay, uh, so four diseases. Common dididosis, dididosa pospolita, regex diarrhea, pigunca regexova, not made here syndrome, syndrome niezrobione unas, and the last one, malicious stringosis, stringosa złośliwa in Polish. Uh, just before we start, a little warning, uh, caveat auditoris. Who knows about the caveat emptor rule from the ancient uh, Roman rule? Nobody? Okay, it's still present in like uh, American system, for example. So let's say you, you're buying a house. So unlike in Poland, when you are the buyer, you don't have to make sure, uh, uh, sorry, in, in Poland you don't have to make sure that there are some flaws or, or, or issues with the property. In the United States, you have to, because it's the buyer responsibility to make sure that it's everything okay with the subject of the transaction, like, like let's say the house. Uh, therefore, they use caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. And here we have caveat auditoris, let the auditorium beware. So it's not me, it's you. Uh, before we start, legendary input-output. I think most of you know this from Norman's architecture, input-output, blah, blah, blah. It's not that important. I think this, this one is much better. I, this is the system. This is the system we have, what, no matter what system that is. This is the input to the system and this is the output. And if you don't know, because I'm a, I'm a person, I'm a village man, so I know that, uh, chickens are, om are omnivores. They eat seeds, corn, uh, worms, everything. If they, they can even be cannibals and eat their own uh, eggs. Anyway, the purpose of this system is to take that very broad, very tolerant input and turn it into a very nice output. That's the purpose of every IT system, deep down there. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the issue is that we should be uh, very tolerant about this, very strict about this, so our uh, systems uh, are really cool and okay. By the way, uh, put put in German means like chick chick or uh, chip chip. So when you, when you feed a chicken. And why do we do that? Because we want our system to be really strong, fast and robust, to take a heavy load. So we should care about our system and make sure it's healthy without any disease. And uh, here, uh, when we say about input and output, this sometimes is the user interface and the database or vice versa. And, uh, you know, when I have a new system to evaluate, to install, to run, I don't take a look at the system itself at the very beginning. I take a look at its UI and its uh, output, like a database, so I can say a lot about the system itself just by taking a look at the input and output format. And this is what, what this talk is all about, taking a look at the input and output of a system to say what's happening in the system. Okay, this is one, common dididosis. In Latin, dididosis silvestris. Uh, who knows the form? Okay, many of you do. <laughs> uh, for those uh, of, uh, of you who don't, this is a part of the tax form uh, in Poland. So it says taxpayer data, last name, first name, birthday, state, uh, province, uh, country, commune, street, house number, apartment number, uh, place like village or city, uh, postal code and uh, post office, like the town or village where, or where the post office is physically located. And this is very, very like, uh, you know, uh, going into a deep details uh, so they can identify you because it's about serious thing, it's about taxes after all. So, uh, this, if you don't know, is uh, one of the most known Polish publishers and they publish IT books. And this is the form when you try to register. It says name or company's name or first name or tax ID. Not very UX, I'd say. And then they say uh, city or post office. And it, from, from this, I can read that they're not really reading the books they publish when it comes to UX, because I think that asking somebody for first name or tax ID is not really a good uh, UI design or user experience. Anyways, this is uh, another, another page, and it says pretty much the same. Here you see there's a postal code and post office. 
Everyone is very interested in, in the exact location of the post office, of, of the location of the building where the guy with a visa is going to your home. So we can then go to the post office and collect your letter. Because, you know, they, they couldn't carry the letter in the first place. And they also always want a house number, well, in not this case, but like in the, this case, they want a house number in a very special field. And uh, when we take a look in here, at this end of the system, we don't know if the postal code in here is required or not, because we don't see the, the red asterisk. So this is another, another example where it doesn't work quite okay, I'd say. Still, they're very eager about the, the, the post office location. They need to know that for, for some reason. Uh, another form, just exactly the same. You see, there's no even like uh, there's a street and postal code and a post office. There's no no room for uh, no no field for a city or town or village you live in. There's just a, a room for or, or field for a street. Another bad design. So let's take a look how the actual post office is doing it. I mean, they might not be very good at delivering sometimes. But usually they know how to address stuff, you know, how to write the recipient's name and address and so on. So this is what they suggest. Like, if it's not a domestic letter, not domestic shipment, then you should put a country, like, which is when it's not Poland. And then when it is Poland, you put a postal code here, you put a city or town, just, just a place where somebody is living or a company is located. Then you put their name and then you put the number of their house, like here. And then there's a simple rule. If they have a street, you put a street here. If they don't have a street, you just repeat the place name here. And that's it. That's that. It's so simple. And look, this is a form of the post office, right? And they don't require you to put the post office location. Right? So why do other companies do that? It's, it's totally absurd. It's, it's written just what I told you. And it, this, this says important because it's in Polish only, but it says it is important that the address should have a postal code and the location of, uh, of the recipient, of the receiver of the letter, not the location of the post office. Nowhere in the docs they're referring to post office location. Nowhere. But for some reason, people are doing that. Uh, like this is a big mall, big warehouse uh, in 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 that, the next village where I live because I live nearby, not in Wrocław, just uh, nearby, in a suburb, so I can, what I could say. And they they put the address like Wrocławska Street, and there's a postal code at uh, Długowęka. It's the name of the village. <coughs> but when you get an invoice from them, suddenly Długowęka turns into Mirkov, and Mirkov is the village, is the next village. Where there's uh, this building, you know, where the post, uh, post uh, is located, where they start carrying like various deliveries or avisos. Uh, so people say, okay, but it's not a big deal. This warehouse is so well known, you know, they, they, they measure their, their place not in square meters but in acres. They're so big, so well recognized, it's not a problem for them. They will get every delivery anyway. However, for some less recognized people, it will not be the same. But take a look at this picture. This is a, a map of, of, uh, of our commune. And Wrocław is located uh, here. We are like more or less in here. And it's not surprised that every village nearby has a Wrocław uh, or Wrocławska street. It's the street, you know, leading you to, to the big city nearby. That's, that's obvious. Uh, but the thing is that these five streets share the same postal code, these two share another postal code, and as far as I know, this one is yet another postal code. So, if they put an address like this, you expect it to be like, more or less like in here. But everyone knows that Selgros uh, on Transgourmet is located in here. So, they, they, like a postman is not going here, it's going in there. Because they, they know that there's no cell growth in here, cell growth is located in there. So, like, this mistake is not a big problem for them, I guess. But it's a big problem if you are named like me. And then you live, uh, like, uh, Polna Street, or Field Street, it's called. It's still a very popular name. And they, they don't use, like, the name of my village, but the name of the village where the post office is located. And then, this is what the streets in our community look like. There's one village, called Dugowenka, another called Stodre, and yet another called Mirkov, and here's the post office in this village, and here's the Polna Street. And, get, and, and I live here. And guess where is the delivery man from another company like DPD, GLS, UPS, uh, calling me, look sir, I can't find your house. 
Are you sure you live here? Huh? And this is, this, is, this is a real problem uh, for me. This is really real pain because I don't get my deliveries. Because somebody, somebody is turning the, the, the location, uh, my location into the location of the post office for some weird reason. And this is a re real issue. And uh, th this is a name of the uh, commune's office and they hacked the, they hacked the system. Like, they're putting the, the location of the post office but they managed to put here in the street name the, the, the name of the of the another village, so they hack the system. They have both, uh, uh -huh. and so I, I I follow the principle, and now I get my like you know whatever I bought, uh, ordered from eBay or, or other locations. Uh, there are more problems with the with the addresses. Like this is one of the most recognized Polish banks. Uh, it might be even state owned, right? And look, they have an enumeration that says like street, avenue, settlement, square, uh, like uh, some other settlement, like a uh, village. Problem is, you can live in boulevard or uh, avenues, like uh, this very huge street, like uh, Aleja Ujazdowski in Warsaw, which says avenues, not avenue, but avenues. And what do you select then in this field? If you happen to live in avenues or in boulevard, you're screwed, you can't have a bank account. Right? So let's skip the other end. Let's not dig into the database. Why should we get dirty? And uh, there are villages in Poland which don't have streets. Like tiny villages I was born in doesn't have any, you know, there are like 20 houses. So there would be more streets than houses. So that's why there's just the name of the village. So s sometimes there are villages without streets. There are states without former streets, like in Africa. It was a great surprise for me that, that, that they didn't have street. Like they, they have some zones, they, they put GPS coordinates in their co contact section of their web pages. And there are states without postal codes. Like you don't have postal zip code. So why should you require it if you make an like international application, web application, whatever? It shouldn't be required, maybe, or not for every local. And why people do that? I ask developers, various developers, why do you require that a house is a separate field? Why do you require the location of the post office? And the answer, because I, I tried to follow you know, the fire by principle, and the answer was because of DDD or even sourcing. And now, I'm, I'm not, I, I won't dare to say that I'm a DDD expert, but surely I think I know what DDD isn't about. And DDD isn't about splitting your input into the very tiny pieces which don't make sense. Okay? Like, Having a special field for a house number might, might make sense for like a pizzeria because they might be very long street and they deliver like to the half of it. So they need to know the number to, you know, to avoid passing or something. Or like a, a town where my granny used to live in. So there was a, like a odd numbers of street belong to one parish and even numbers belong to another parish. So there's no conflict between priests in between, right? So if we're like the, it's here, and, and the border between parishes is in here, and we know that this even numbers belong to one parish, old numbers belong to another parish. That's a valid business case. That's a part of your model, of your system. That makes sense and excuse for DDD to apply. But if you have like a central shipment center, and you send your goods to whole Poland, there's no need for separate field of, uh, to carry the, the house number. Because what even sourcing can you think? Okay, we make promotion for guys uh, whose house, num uh, house numbers are divided by three. Doesn't make sense, right? So DDD or even sourcing are an excuse here. And let's take a look again at the form. This, this was an envelope form, a piece of paper. Uh, I think all Poles know that. So if you have like registered uh, uh, mail or regist recorded delivery, this is the form you had to fill in. And it says postal code, city or town or village, and here is a free text entry. And that's it, right? And these folks are delivering letters for 100 letters, uh, sorry, years. So I think they, they're quite you know, into the business and they know how to put address labels. So maybe we should follow them and have such a simple form. If we don't care about the house number or, or, or where the post office is located, right? Or, so this is like Allegro, this is like a Polish equivalent of eBay, and they almost did that. See, there's address, there's a postal code, and this is like lo your location, and there's a province, man, no, maybe for statistics, maybe for something, they could like uh, compute that from postal code, but anyway, and this is it. 
This is a simple form. There's no special field for like a house number, like a apartment number, or a, like a city where your post office is, because it doesn't make sense to them, because they send goods or, or issue invoices from one place for a whole country. And that's it. It's so simple. So my prescription, don't excuse yourself with DDD when you make a stupid UI, especially if you don't know what you're talking about, if you don't know what DDD is. Because DDD surely isn't about dividing your input or output into as tiny you know, pieces of data as possible without no business reason. Okay, disease two, which is regex diarrhea. In Latin, diarrhea regex is, in Polish, bigun karegitsova. I think a lot of people suffer from this disease. Uh, let's go to electronic <coughs> email this time. And uh, say uh, you want to create an account with Orange because you, you like to get like fiber optics or uh, get a cell phone. And as you can see, you can't use this as an email address. I think in, in this very conference, people know that this is a correct email address, right? You can put like a plus and then it becomes a, your label in Gmail. That's a perfectly valid email address. Valid according to all RFCs and so on and so on. Yet it's, it's, it says, please enter correct email address because this seems to be like incorrect. Uh, or this one, like uh, social security in Poland. And this is also a email, valid email address. I can have, of course, I don't have mailbox at this very DNS server, right? But I can have a mailbox and a server which doesn't have like domain. And still, it's perfectly valid for, valid for receiving emails. And, and they say it's invalid. By the way, take a look uh, at the stupid password, which is like super cool because everything's checked. I have another talk about this stupid password. Anyway, this is like when you buy or sell a car in Poland, you have to register it, right? So in my country, they, they made like a super easy for, for the buyers or sellers, so you can like pre-register to get your ticket, so we can like, uh, you have like an appointment at a certain time, so we don't have to wait half a day in a long queue. Again, I would try to register with my perfectly valid email, and I couldn't. Incorrect email uh, format. For some reason, so I took a look, you know, because this time I broke the rule, and I took a look at this code. Okay, uh, and in Poland, you, in Polish, you don't say you don't take a look. In Polish, you throw an eye, right? You throw an eye on the code. So, Mister, throw an eye on the code. Oh, almost there, almost there. Okay, so uh, uh, eye for an eye. So this is an eye for you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so this is the this is the code. This is the code, it's verbatim, yeah? I, I, play, I, I pasted it here just as it goes. And as you can see, just before the at, you can't have a plus sign. Although it's perfectly valid, but you can have like two dots uh, in common, or you can start with dot, or you can have all the dots be, be, be before uh, the at sign. Uh, by the way, take a look at this return true, return false. Uh, and uh, here, at this very end, you see that after the last dot, you can have uh, from two to four characters, which is okay for EU, like com or info, but think about all these like dot events or dot academy, these new TLDs, right? It won't work. Again, such a stupid, there's a name. There's one name in this very file, but I don't know if it's the name of the author of this very function. That's why I, I won't quote the name, but uh, you may take a look if you wish. Um, okay, so this is a bunch of correct email addresses. Uh, the, all these email addresses correct, are correct, like even, even this one is uh, correct for the last few years, like in uh, UTF local part before uh, the no domain name. You can put like dots, you can put plus sign, you can quote it, everything is okay. And here's the list of the incorrect email addresses. See, you can't begin with the dot, you can't have two consecutive dots. It's, in, it's incorrect. Yet that uh, previous uh, regex I'm showing you would uh, accept this because they don't check if there are two uh, consecutive dots. So, you know, is it even possible to validate an email address with a regular expression? I did that, uh, I had that question and I did what every developer does, so I asked Stack Overflow, right? And I, and I found a, a, such a question and there was an answer and for Java, I don't know any, about uh, any other languages, but for Java, this is the regex. <laughs> and 
I, let's say I didn't manage to break it. Like I used all these correct and incorrect emails and a few others, and uh, it, it didn't have false positives or false negatives. So <coughs> this is the regular expression for Java to validate if uh, the email address is actually correct. So uh, as you can see, I, I show that I have shown that in a in a bootcamp because I'm also a bootcamp trainer or teacher, and they, they you know these newbies ask me, did you write that? <laughs> Not quite. Uh, okay, so even if it looks like being valid, take a look, you can misspell the address. I misspelled the misspelled name, right? And, and I doubled that, and this is like for e-governance in Poland. And still, if you even require to, for someone to like, enter it again, it doesn't prevent, because what do you do? You copy and paste, right? Everyone copy and paste. So they would copy misspelled address and paste it here, and voila, it's valid. But there's no such domain or mailbox. Right? So maybe you should use RFC, like implement the RFC, RFC uh, by your own, uh, but uh, th there's a number of RFCs, uh, but maybe a server, which is going to be used, I think our sending server or the receiving server uh, don't support some, you know, uh, corner cases of these RFCs. Or maybe we should test, uh, perform MX or SMTP test, but maybe again the server doesn't support that. Uh, and maybe there's no such a mailbox, like in the previous example. Or maybe an antivirus will stop it because we, I don't know, we sent too many links or we are blacklisted or something. Or maybe there is such a mailbox and exists but it doesn't belong to the user who's trying to register. There, there are a lot of maybes. So maybe we should validate uh, who wants to throw an eye in this case. Maybe you sir. Throw an eye, throw an eye on this. Again, it, this is PHP, this is PHP, and please tell me, uh, I'll try to uh, yeah, adjust it a little tiny bit, and tell me what's being validated here, in this regular expression. Come on, I have some jellies. What's being validated here? URL, who said URL? Okay, jellies for you. Throw and catch. Perfect exception handling. Yeah, that's a, that's a validation of a URL. And this is how they validate URL in a, in a PF sense, which is a firewall distribution. And guess what can pass it? Like, this can pass it. This is a valid URL according to this regex. I checked that. And this one too. And th this might look okay, but uh, this one with, with the space here, this is space, non breaking space. It will pass, uh, sorry, like breaking space, normal uh, uh, space, it will pass too. And this will pass as well. This is a valid URL according to this regular expression. By the way, take a look at this ugly smell here, right? Like, if match, then return true, else return false, yeah? You don't write code like this, I hope. You really don't. Anyway, let's go further. So, if there's an old wisdom of the people of Dakota tribe, and they say, if you have a problem, and you try to solve it with a regular expression, you end up having two problems. But it doesn't apply to Perl, of course. In Perl, you solve everything using a regular expression. Uh, so my prescription, if you collect email addresses to send something using these email addresses, because this is what we collect these email addresses, right? We don't do that for statistics. Oh, these many people with .com, these many people with .eu. We collect these email addresses to send something to the user. So maybe we should validate if this email is working and they can receive this email just by sending the first message to verify that. In your regex, maybe you should validate if it contains this, you know, at or donkey, if it has one, one letter uh, in front of it, one after at least, and then it's like, then it's like you know, like minimum viable uh, email address to try to send an email. And it might be valid. Disease three, oh right, uh, not made here syndrome. Uh, in Latin, syndroma non fecit anobis, syndrome nie zrobione unas. Uh, who wants to throw an eye? Any volunteers? Okay, uh, there's a volunteer to throw an eye, okay, so uh, just throw it well, okay? Throw an eye really, really well. You can approach the screen, you can approach the screen, there's you know, a lot of room here. You can approach the screen and again, eye for an eye, if you if you're through well. Exactly, so here it is, an eye for an eye. 
so tell me, folks, what's being held in this very important table? What's the meaning of this ID column? ID. Just ID, yeah. And what's stored here and created? Timestamp, time yeah, you broke it. I throw your catch, okay? Ah, almost. Sorry. Yeah, and, and instead of long, in timestamp and long, you can keep it as a variable character as well. Just some, some text to keep it in, a, in some, you know, weird format. Uh, and sometimes you can even see something like this. Yeah, and this is the output of the system we're examining now. We are not taking it, uh, a look, uh, we don't throw an eye into the code. So it's like created date and created hour. Okay? So they, they, they decided to split. I, I saw that. I really saw that in the production system. But not exactly this, but you know, this is like a obfuscated, okay? Um, so why people don't simply do something like this? Right? There's a special type in SQL, timestamp with time zone. You always want to keep your dates with time zone or in UTC. You really do, trust me on this. And then, you know, you end up something like this. This is a C sharp from daily WTF. This is a parser, you know, because they had like this custom uh, variable character format or something like this, so ha they had to parse it, you know. Or in other languages, there's also like, uh, you know, some, some parsers that like you take with the first part of the split is like less than 10, then you like add a number and blah, 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 blah. Yeah? It's so stupid, so ridiculous. Because no project is crappy enough in its crappiness without its own date parser. This is what I uh, saw somewhere in the WTF. The daily WTF. Uh, another example, database in database. Something like this. Who saw such a table? I, I saw it many times. This is how uh, I was told, this is how uh, SAP works. So, like, you have ID. Then you have a column for data, and then you have yet another column describing what this kind, what, what kind of data this is, right? Because you want the flexibility. So this is actually the reinvention of the SQL and SQL, right? Creating database and database for the flexibility reasons. Or what about generating S, uh, CSV in database, right? Uh, you get this, that, something else from number of tables, then you generate a header, then you for each row and for each column, and remember, if that was the timestamp, yeah, from previous example, then you format this as, as a date. If, it, if it's not a date, then you format it as a something else. But don't forget to escape, you know, commas. And then you generate like new lines, formatting, etc., etc. And in PostgreSQL, you can do it just like that. You can have your actual query, written in here, and just wrap it into a copy and to standard output, and then just redirect it to a file. Voila, that's it. That's how you can generate a CSV in, in Postgres. You don't need to you know, do that explicitly in some kind of stored procedure, opening code source, and so on. This is what you do. You write your query and you wrap it. Just copy the standard output. This happens when you roll your own implementation of something which is already done by someone. So, if you have itchy fingers, in Polish you have itchy fingers. You have itchy fingers. So, you have, if you have itchy fingers, to parse or store dates your own way, or implement database in database, or develop your own DNS resolver, because, you know, current uh, uh, DNS resolver sucks. Or if you want to hash passwords your own way, or generate CSV, you should remember that someone somewhere already did that, and most probably better. So my prescription for this disease, if you're holding a golden hammer, you know, you, you have learned a new tool. Now you know how to write C tool, yeah? So you can, you know how to write a database in database or generate a, a CSV using SQL. So if, you, if you're holding this golden hammer and you want to hammer in everything into your code, just you want to, you know, smash those nails with you, it doesn't matter if it's a nail or something else with, a, with this golden hammer, ask your friend to hit you softly. Just, you know, just give you a little slap. 
hey, dude, maybe you shouldn't use that hammer just because you know it and it looks so nice, so golden and so on. The last disease, malicious stringosis. In Latin, stringosa malignum, and in Polish, stringosa zmuśniba. Uh, we can carry on with this uh, example we had. And now, if this important table is a client, and we have for ID, we have uh, 36 characters, which is 32 UUID characters, right, with uh, three dashes. Uh, or four dashes, sorry, and we keep created as a variable character because we want to pass on on dates, right? And we have a name for a variable character, tax ID or a nip in Polish as a long and balance in double and check and we check precision here. And here we have another check for UID <coughs> format, if it's really UID format. And we can, we can have something in this very end of the, of the system we have. And it, this is a corresponding class. Like we have a string ID, string created, string name, long text ID, and double balance. We, we have a like double here, not, not small, uh, like a lower uh, case double, because this might end up null. Right? For new clients, new clients don't have that. That's why we have the big double, not small double. Uh, and then, in each and every method in your code, you end up having something like this. If you have a function which is related to text ID, you have this validation utils namespace class, which says tax ID is correct or not. If it's not correct, then you throw an exception. And the same for client ID. And there's business logic in here after you pass this validation. Uh, let's try to do that again, <laughs> this very example. Let's try to revisit it. And maybe we can do it like this. Okay? Turn it into UID, because if it's UID, let's use UID, not, not variable character. Right? And again, for created, let's use timestamp. Name is pretty obvious a name, yeah? like you don't have any special type for name, any better than variable character. But for tax ID in Poland, maybe we can turn it into like term characters. It's not the best, but it's better than just a long. Because there's no ID like minus 42, right? Uh, and the balance for balance in PostgreSQL, you can use money type. Which will take care of the precision and so on and so on. And then in our, let's say, Java class, we have UID, instant form created, this is immutable, we have string ID, we have a special type, new type, tax ID for our tax ID, and we have monetary uh, amount from Moneta to keep balance. And we can just like map it, you know, between database and our business code. And maybe we can go even better. Maybe we can do something like this. Take, let's, let's take a look. Uh, we have UID here and we have balance here. We can, maybe we can do like this. We can turn it into client ID. So we make sure that we don't assign a random UID by just a client ID here. And we got rid of the balance. Why? Because balance is mutable. It changes. It's, it's the very purpose of having a balance, that it can change, right? It's not fixed. So we, now we have client ID. You know, you don't change the IDs of your clients. You don't change the, when they were created. Name changes so readily that you can do that manually in the SQL database. And tax ID doesn't change at all. So this, this becomes immutable. This could be like a value class or, or whatever you have in coffee. And then in each and every method, like for a, let's say a Java or, or, or a similar language, you can have like a, t a tax ID related operation and takes tax ID only. Not any other long, just tax ID. And after you make sure it's not null, you can go on with your business logic. And in languages like C Sharp or Kotlin, you can make sure that it's not now right in here. Right? So you don't need this line at all. You just make sure that if this method is called, it receives something that is tax ID and it's not and it's not now. So you avoid this one billion dollar mistake. And and here again for client rated operation you pass client ID, not just any other UUID or, or, or string or long. You just pass client ID and if you make sure it's not null, you can carry on. Because you just created once and it's immutable and you can put it into various places in your code. And thanks to that we get rid of various absurd uh, in our API. Like what does it mean? If the ID is a string, what does it mean? What what business value? You know, what's the what business purpose stands behind such a call? That you get the first character of a client ID. If it's UID, you can get like 16 options here. So what's the purpose of it? You switch by this, you enumerate, you print it, the first character. It's not like a short uh, hash of git commit, right? So it doesn't make sense. It's an absurd. Or this, 
What does it mean to concatenate client side A with client stack side A with a space and, and turn it into bytes in UTF-8 in your domain-driven design code? Or this, if, if you have client ID which is a long and create and it's also as a timestamp kept, kept as a long, what does it have to have like a minimum value of this? But you can write it and the compiler will not warn you, right? So this, this code compiles, it's like long client ID and long client created and you get the minimum value, but what for? But you can write it, okay? So remember, premature optimization is pretty much the root of all evil. And mutable objects are also premature optimization because I want to save memory. But then you have all these, you know, synchronization issues and so on and so on and save copies, deep copies, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. So maybe you'd like to avoid mutable uh, objects because they are premature optimization. And is it to generate JSON is not an argument. Like, uh, if I have the strings and logs, it, it, it will be easy to generate JSON. Then write some serializer or mashal or whatever to generate this bloody JSON. And uh, this was one of the tweets from Zach Coleman. And it says, like, looks like he's using, like, a Python or PHP, and uh, he has to write tests. Like, what happens if an argument to my function is null or string or a number or negative or something like this? And there was a brilliant answer uh, from uh, Mario Fusco that this, you know, the library to do this bloody test for you is statically typed language like Java, like Compton, like Scala, right? This is the, this bloody library that makes those tests of types for you. So, my prescription, every time you keep stuff in Java, in Kotlin, in Scala, in any other statically typed language, as string, as long, as double, you know, primitive type, think really, really hard if you're not turning it into a PHP. Because this is what you effectively do. If you keep everything as string, as long, as double, you turn it into dynamically typed language. When you need to check what came in this argument, every goddamn time you try to use it. Conclusion. Another tweet from Mario Fusco. He says that if you choose a data structure, so this is, the, let's say, the output of our system for web development. If you choose correct how you store it, you know, then it's difficult to break it with algorithm. And I think that something similar applies to UI, the other end of the system. If you do it correctly, it's, it's not as easy to spoil it, to break it, to destroy it with a stupid algorithm. That's why you should care about the ends of the system, the input and the output. And guys, just uh, remember that you should always, and, and everyone should do that, you should feedback your speakers. Not, not only me, not only at this very conference, but every conference, every speaker. Uh, if you are afraid of something like a digital, this, this can do like one uh, lady did. She just wrote, wrote a piece of paper and she said, I'm too shy. <laughs> but, but feedback, in any, way, in any way, just feedback. Uh, thanks a lot. This is a link. Uh, remember to stay fit. Keep your systems healthy. And we have like five minutes for questions. And I have some jellies left, if you have some questions. No questions? Everyone cured? I can ask you one question. Uh, have you heard about uh, what three words about your first disease? That's the solution for the, for the, it's a different tool, but yeah. have you heard about what three words as an application that uh, defines uh, new addresses for every place on earth? Uh, this what? is the solution for, well, for the, well, we could use that, but you know, in, like in Poland, we don't be, we don't deliver stuff using like GPS coordinates, for instance. That would be like require you know latitude and longitude, even two words. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I get what you mean with uh, these three words. Yeah, what what three words is an app uh, that defines an Earth as a flat surface and divides whole uh, finished surface uh, with uh, squares uh, three by three, uh, and defines for each square on Earth uh, three words that describe the location. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know that. Yeah, that that's, this, maybe it's not the question, but I was one of the judges. So. Okay. <laughs> Unless he's honest. Okay. Any more questions? So you guys, I really, really hope we'll not just blindly go to use regular expression next time you have to validate something. Okay, that's the takeaway from this talk, I hope. Thank you very much, then. Enjoy your lunch.